Well, hello again. I have a treat for you today. We are going to the Old Testament. We don't get there often. <laughs> we often find ourselves in the New Testament, but today we're going to a, a, a book in the Bible that we rarely look at. First Kings chapter three, verses 16 through 28. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house. And I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, Clearly, it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine and the dead son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. While the other says, not so, your son is dead and my son is the living one. So the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the living boy in two. Then give half to the one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because of your compassion for your son burning within her, please, my lord, give her the living boy Certainly do not kill him. But the other lady said, it shall be neither mine nor yours, divide it. Then the king responded, give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning, the compassion factor. The compassion factor. Gloria Williams had a miscarriage at eight months pregnant. Her body continued to experience the symptoms of pregnancy, for which there is a medical term. Williams felt pressure from her boyfriend, Charles Manigo, to have a child. Yet, she believes his abuse is what might have led to her miscarriage and to another tragedy. Williams' two sons from a previous marriage had already been taken from her deemed unsafe to live with their father. <clears throat> My abusive ex asked me to have a baby. He wanted me to have a baby, told me it would make him stable. I wanted to believe that. So when she miscarried, she kept it a secret. Instead, she drove from the border of South Carolina where she lived all the way to Florida Hospital. She reports on autopilot, stared at the infants in the nursing ward, and wandered the hallways to Shanera Mobley's room. She sat down and talked to Shanera, who was a 16-year-old new mom, who reported she did not even know what she was going to do with her baby. And then Mobley made a decision, perhaps thinking it would help this mom, perhaps still in shock over the loss of her own child, perhaps a victim of domestic violence, perhaps quite traumatized herself with no mental health intervention. A three-time mother with no kids, she dressed up as a nurse, entered back into the hospital, took the newborn baby out for reported tests, and never returned. Gloria raised Kamaya 
also known as Alexis, for 18 years. When Alexis turned 16, Alexis wanted to get a job and she needed a birth certificate, except for there was no birth certificate. She kept pressing her mom for her birth certificate so that she could go and get a job. Her and her mom had a beautiful relationship and so her mom finally confessed to her. She told her daughter everything. The daughter decided not to report her mom. But slowly things would unravel. Gloria was brought to trial. It did come out. She was found and sentenced to 18 years in jail. She appealed for a reduced sentence last year and was denied. Kamaya, also known as Alexis, has met her real family and bonded with her dad, but is clashing with her biological mom. On Mother's Day, she reaches out to the woman who raised her saying, I know what she did was wrong, but that's my real mom. Her biological mom says, I wish I had never met her because the pain that she has brought to my life and to my family and to the four kids I do have with me has not been worth it. Who is the real mother? Today in the biblical text, we hear a story of two mothers. It's maybe a less common biblical story and yet much more complex. Here on the hills of Solomon asking for wisdom from God is an opportunity for him to show just how wise he is and win the approval of all those he's providing leadership for. And an all too common narrative of men being thrusted into fame on the backs of yet women as if to put more distance between them, him and them, they tell us that these two women are prostitutes. Before Judge Solomon now stands two women claiming to be the mother of one child. He's been given the task of deciding who's the real mama. Two women standing before him arguing over the same baby as if there are not enough kids in the world to love as if we've got a shortage of children, so much so that before Judge Solomon stood two women arguing that they were both the mama of a baby, new to the world. We all know that there could only be one biological mama back then, and yet two are making the same claim. How odd a story to appear right here in the Old Testament, in the Kings, mothers arguing over a child. And for a minute, we are held in suspense, wondering how Solomon will figure out who is the real mama. Judgment is a tricky thing because we make decisions on what we know, but what we don't know is limited. I was reminded of this often when I was driving two boys in the car and we would pass a police officer with sirens and someone would be pulled over on the side. It was always interesting to hear the two boys discuss what was really going on, even though we were riding in our comfortable car. And I would always wonder, what do we know? There are all kinds of crooks and nannies and cracks and dark places unexposed. When others have been certain with limited knowledge, it seems a curse put on me to ponder, what is it that we really know? What is it that we really know about COVID-19? What are they not telling us? What's the whole story? Because of the course, the story and the news we are fed is not often everything. And so often we can jump to conclusions about people and places and things without a whole lot of knowledge. In fact, one boss told me, Charlene, the less people know, the more they talk. I don't know about if this is a universal truth, but at least over here in the churches I've served, I have found that to be true. That the less people know, the more they talk, and the more judgment gets dispensed. And so I'm wondering now, just how will Solomon judge this situation? Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Talking to Strangers, mentions a conversation between then British Prime Minister and Adolf Hitler. Other leaders had talked with Hitler too when they had heard of rumors of what possibly he was up to. And so the British prime minister decides to have a conversation with Hitler. 
Here's the thing, after talking to the prime minister, the prime minister comes to the conclusion that this is a good guy. He judges that he makes his, some promises to the prime minister and the prime minister believes him. Other leaders as well that met with Hitler came to the same conclusion. But boy, were they shocked when Hitler did everything that he promised he wouldn't do. You see, judgment is hard. And Solomon at least gets that much so that God divvies out wisdom. And Solomon goes on to make a landmark Supreme Court decision in the case of the real mama versus the false mama. So let's start with what the text tells us. There are two women and two babies. There are two mothers when the story begins and two living baby. That's good, one kid for each mama. According to the first woman's story, she gave birth first, but the other lady was pregnant and gave birth three days later. And this lady rolled over on her baby and killed him in the night. Oh well. And having killed her baby, she decides to get up and takes her dead baby to the other mother and lays them there and picks up the living baby and takes the baby. The lady says, when I woke up, I saw that my son was dead. But upon further notice and inspection, I realized this wasn't my son at all. That low-down heifer took my son as her own. Now, because she threw the ball, the other lady is swinging. She's defensive. And she swears that the story that the other lady is spitting is untrue and that her son is alive. And this lady has just fabricated one of the best lies I have ever heard. Is your head hurting? Don't let nobody tell you ever that the Bible isn't interesting. I read a lot of fiction, and this story is up there among incredible. So who's the real mama? And just so you know, motherhood is about more than who delivers babies. But before I tell you what King Solomon says and does, what do you think? Who's the real mama? Well, you already know the real mama because I read the text to you just a few seconds ago. And I know who the real mama is because I read the story before you, or maybe I didn't, or I think I read it before you. This text rose to me this week, and really I thought it was a safe text. It was easy until I felt the Lord speaking to me in the middle of the week. And maybe God works differently for you, but when I'm getting sure of myself, God usually throws a curveball in the middle of the week to humble me, maybe to make me curious, maybe to keep me in prayer, maybe to hold me in relationship, in tension with the text a little bit longer. So I'm not an apostle, and I'm not a bishop, and I'm not a prophet or a king or a judge, and 15 years ago I wasn't even a mother. So, I started pondering this. Both ladies are the real mother. Yeah, you heard me. Both ladies are the real mother. Motherhood is a sacrifice. Folks love to put that one up there and beat us down with the virtuous woman in Proverbs. Stop. But mothers, at least the ones I've met, are way more complicated and rich and full of color than the woman in Proverbs. Look, I was looking at the red table this week and they decided to honor three women who had been doing labor and sacrifice since COVID-19. One of them was a nurse. We are nurses, but we are also doctors. One of them was a cafeteria worker. We are cafeteria workers trying to feed babies even when school is out. We are helpers. We are many things, but we are human. We are vulnerable. We are trying like most to do the best with what we got, but some of us don't have a lot to work with. Nishi Nas says, you have some people who make decisions in their brokenness and it only hurts them. And there are other people who make decisions in their pain and that ripple effect is far and wide. If you had a great mama, great, but not all humans have had great mamas. Some folks have had terrible mamas. 
and some have had their mamas ripped away too soon, and that hurts. And when you get all up in your mother's garden, well, there are all kinds of things growing and things threatening to take life, and that's for real. I imagine it's complicated, and that covers some of it, and that's, that's, that's for real. But it doesn't make our mother any less real, and that's why I say both of these ladies were real mamas, just because. Just because we're complicated, <laughs> we're nuanced. For Alexis, a.k.a. Kamaya, her real mom is the one who stole her from the hospital, probably still in pain herself, and raised her, not the lady that gave birth to her and has been missing her for all of 18 years. Just keep your finger on that and let's see what Solomon has to say. Solomon lets the moms talk and the more they talk, the more things don't get resolved. Each woman is holding fast to I'm the real mama. Each is asserting that the living child is theirs and no one claims the dead child. Think about that. They each make their case for why this child, this living child, is their child. And finally, the wisdom of God, like rainfall, comes down upon Solomon. Okay, since I cannot decide who is lying and who is telling the truth, I'm just going to cut this baby in half and give one part to you and one part to you. But it's a trick statement. So the lady whose baby was living said, don't do that. Let the child live. But who is the mama whose baby is living? The second lady said, okay, I'll take my half and give her her half. And that's how Solomon feels he came to know who the real mama was. But even in that, I'm not persuaded with Solomon's wisdom. But this is a sermon, so I ain't going down that road today. Here is the good news that falls from God's lip to Solomon, to mine, to yours, because of the compassion in her for her son. She would rather give him up than to see him die. Compassion is a powerful tool in a mother's life, but compassion is a powerful tool in the believer's life. When the love that burns inside of us not only allows us to walk towards others with respect, but when that same love even necessitates letting go of someone that they may live. It's Mother's Day, and this is a beautiful and a hard day, but this text reminds us that we all have stories that sometimes reek with horror. The gift we bring as mothers and daddies and lovers and brothers and sisters and cousins and friends and humans, the real gift we offer especially to those that cry the loudest and make bad choices, is the gift of compassion. We can listen when others jump to judgment and conclusion. We can listen when others are riddled with fear and anger and hate and bigotry. We can hear the spirit behind what others share. When we listen to people's stories, the whole story, it makes a difference. <clears throat> Last year, a few of us from church went to a violence conference, except for they called it a cafe. I was wondering how this was going to roll out, and I was on the planning team, and we were trying to get people to come from Indiana and Illinois. We knew that the people gathered in Indiana might be of a slightly different persuasion. We wondered how to have this conversation. And then someone introduced to us what is called cafe conversation. It's when you open a conversation not stating what your side is, but you begin to talk about your stories. As I sat around the table with strangers, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, talking to strangers, as I sat around talking to strangers, we began to share our stories of violence and our stories with guns. It was a whole different flavor. Nobody was trying to argue their position but through hearing people's stories, a compassion emerged for each other. And then we had a real discussion, and we were all on the same side. I believe there's more to these women's stories. Often there's more to mother's stories. We try to oversimplify women and people, but we're complicated. 
Sometimes I ask a person, why did you do that? And they'll be like, I don't know. They're telling the truth. They don't. <laughs> we are complicated. But once we can hear each other's stories, there lies a door of compassion. And when we hear enough stories, we begin to paint a landscape. In a world divided and fearful and worried, in a world of pandemics, in a world of so many deaths each day, in a world where the economy may collapse, in a world where jobs are crumbling, in a world where some people don't know how they're going to make it, in a world of loss, in everything else under the sun, let us hear people's stories. Let us hear like the little boy that sat there with the marshmallows and his parents told him not to eat. Let us hear. Let us listen. Let us pray. Let us roll up our sleeves. Let us find a way to help. But let us not operate out of fear. Let us be overwhelmed with compassion like this woman burning inside of us, the real mama, because compassion for each other makes a difference. Happy Mother's Day. Amen. <laughs>